Cause for optimism. The afternoon play approaches Pride and Prejudice from a brand new angle. That's next. The Media Show. It's topical. It's every week. It's live. A new weekly program from BBC Radio 4. Oh, Culture. Creativity. But it'll also look at ethics, the business and the politics of media. With Steve Hewlett. The buzzword, if you like, is a convergence. As newspapers go online, radio starts using pictures. We get media in all sorts of different forms. Media is omnipresent. The Media Show. Wednesdays at 1.30. Or download the podcast from our website. We shouldn't be doing this. Yes, we should. It's against the rules. Oh, don't be such a muff. I'm not a muff. Yes, you are, and a fuss of us. Well, with comedy now, as the writer Judith French takes an unorthodox flick through the pages of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice to reveal the untold story of its backstage rebel, the young and impertinent Miss Lydia Bennet. In the afternoon play, Unseen Austen. This is the door. We shouldn't be doing this. Yes, we should. It's against the rules. Oh, don't be such a muff. I'm not a muff. Yes, you are, and a fuss of us. Oh, come on, this is the door. Oh, a fuss of us? I should never have brought you. Oh, you're so rude. Just go back, I'll do it myself. I'm not going back on my own. What's a fuss of? Oh, Lord. Lydia. Either get lost or shut your gob. Where do you learn such language? Where do you think? I don't know. Where does any of our language come from? From her, of course. From who? The author. The author? Yes. But the author doesn't know language like that. Yes, she does. I don't believe you. She's a lady. It says so on the flyleaf. Well, she doesn't write it down, pothead. She knows it. But where did she learn it? I don't know. Those sailor brothers of hers. George the farmhand. Who can say? I can't believe it. Look, are we going to do this or not? Because if you haven't the spunk, I'll go on my own. Oh, well... All right. Lydia? Yes? How do you know about it, then? I mean, how is it that you know about her bad language and I don't? Kitty, if we were to make a list of all the things I know and you don't, we'd be here till our puppies dropped off. Oh. You also dreams about all sorts of things. Acting on the stage. Oh, gosh. Travelling the world. Heavens! Standing in the true pride of nakedness and being caressed oh. by a tall, proud Italian merchant. Oh. Good God! Or is that one of mine? Can't remember. Anyway, then she just gets on with her dull old three or four families in a country village. <coughs> now come on, and stop coughing. We mustn't be heard. Sorry. Why not? I mean, what'll happen if she finds us? I don't know. She'll be furious. We might be written out. Oh! Might turn the whole plot crazy. Good thing, too. It's not that bad. Yes, it is. All you do is sit there and cough, and then we walk to the next village, and I say, oh, Lord, and then play lotto. Oh. Those two stuck-up cows have all the fun. Oh, you shouldn't talk about Jane and Lizzie like that. I want excitement. I want adventure. I want passion. Oh, Lydia! With a man who isn't called George, followed by a beautiful white wedding with lots of lace. What's wrong with men called George? Every man in this damn novel is called George. They're not. Or Charles. I don't think she knows any other names. Now shut up. I'm going in. Oh. Lydia! What? It's just... This is against the rules. I don't care. Three straws about the rules. Oh. I want to know what happens next. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a woman. She's tall. Where is Where are we? Return to your own. What is this? Are we in a cathedral? Of course not. This is the manuscript. The manuscript of the right honourable Lady Catherine de Berg. But it's vast. Yes, it's getting bigger all the time. Why, here we are at the Netherfield Ball. Oh, that's right. I wore my sprigged muslin with the blue trimmings and I danced with Colonel Forster. Oh, and here's the lottery party, John Phillips. Oh, oh, Lydia, it's all such fun, really, it is. I don't know why you should find it dull. Why is it all blank and black over there? There, where it curves away like the darkness of outer space. 
sure it isn't finished yet. Oh, oh good heavens. Oh, do you see? Just before it starts to go black, where the words are all faint. Yes. That's what's just been written. That's what's happening next. Oh, oh my. God, I can't look. I can, so stop flapping. Oh, Lord. Oh, my Lord. What? Oh, oh she made the end. She'll hear us. What does it say? In Lydia's imagination, a visit to Brighton comprised every possibility of earthly happiness. She saw, with the creative eye of fancy, the streets of that riotous bathing place covered with offices. Oh. She saw herself the object of attention. She saw all the glories of the camp, its tents crowded with the young and the gay and dazzling with scarlet. And she saw herself seated beneath the tent, tenderly flirting with at least six officers at once. Oh. You're going to Brighton. At last. That's not fair. Something's happening to me. Oh, why aren't I going? I'm going to be covered with officers. Why can't I go? A trip to Brighton. Six officers at once. Everything that is charming. Myself, the object of attention. Oh. Au revoir, Kitty, you silly snot. Oh, but you can't go yet. This section isn't finished. Oh, Lord, what will become of me? Lydia, you're jumping sequence. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. I shall go distracted. Oh, Lydia. So, my name's Lydia Bennett, and I'm 16, almost, and my mother's as vulgar as I am. <laughs> and I've got four older sisters who I'm trying not to talk to because they're so boring. <laughs> and in any case, I'm taller than any of them. And my father's boring too, and he just sits in the library all day and makes smarmy remarks. But he's a gentleman, although he's not rich at all. <laughs> But I do have high animal spirits, and I'm very well grown. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I can gargle. Gargle? Hmm. Humans, you know, like this. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. Oh. Shall I do some more? Well. I shall need another glass of port, though. Have you been gargling long? Oh, yes. My sister Kitty and I used to see who could keep it up the longest when we were brushing our teeth. I always won. She got so cross once, she threw a chamber pot at me. <laughs> huh. And how do you like Brighton, Miss Lydia? Brighton? Oh, la, sure, and fiddledy dee It's better than the country. <laughs> but there still doesn't seem to be much going on. In fact, I haven't actually been outside this ballroom. I thought now that I was the object of everyone's attention that things would start to happen. Hmm. I suppose they will soon enough. But what about you? What's your name? George. George? Hmm. Oh. And have you always had such a long chin? I believe so, Miss Lydia. I inherited from my father, who was a steward of Pemberley, the seat of the Darcy family. It has been called aristocratic. I can't think why. Looks like a slab of cheese. Really? <laughs> I had a friend once whose aunt had a chin just like that. <laughs> Whenever we met, I used to say, Hetty, how's that aunt of yours with the cheese slab? <laughs> How we laughed. <laughs> ah, should we dance this next one? My apologies, Miss Lydia. I am already engaged. Oh, who to? Anybody else in the room? Excuse me. Well, bog off then, you poxy stuck up prig. I oh, beg your pardon, madam. <laughs> Lydia. Oh, Kitty! Yes, it's me. That man who you were dancing with, you do know who he is, don't you? Because I've got some delicious news. Whatever are you doing here? Don't tell me you've been written into this part. No, I'm here by myself. What do you mean? Well, I was so jealous of your going to Brighton, and then after I'd watched you go and seen how you did it, I thought, why shouldn't I go anyway? So I slipped off back to the manuscript when no one was looking, and I hopped into this chapter and here I am. But you could keep her the whole novel doing stunts like that. I have just as much right as you. And a little sea bathing might cure my cough. What's this news of yours, anyhow? Oh, yes. Well, on my way here, I happened to pass a little note the author had scribbled in the margin. You're going to elope. Elope? Oh, I knew you'd be pleased. <gasps> Things are happening at last. When do I go? Tonight. Tonight? At midnight. Midnight? Oh, this is something like... Where are we going to? Gretna Green, of course. Oh, you're going to get married. Oh, Gretna Green! 
her romantic and lovely. Is it with Mr Bingley? No, George Wickham. You know, the man you were dancing with just now? That was George Wickham. I thought I'd die of boredom. He's awful. Well, what's happened to Darcy? He's not married already, is he? No, but... George Wickham! This has to be a joke, a mistake, a bad dream. Whatever's wrong? You liked him in Chapter 15. Don't be ridiculous. I can't even remember that far back. Well, I can. <gasps> oh, Elizabeth! Oh, no. You were out of your senses about him, as was every girl in this novel. What are you doing here, Lizzie? Come to stick your oar in as usual? Oh, sister, I don't pretend to be capable of such coarseness of expression as yourself. But I concur with the sentiment. Which means, in plain English, I'm here to stick my oar in. Oh. Or rather, to represent to you both the folly, the imprudence, nay, the downright wickedness of what you're doing. Kitty, would you care to explain yourself? What's the meaning of this disgraceful display of independence? Well, that is... Uh, I just want to... I'm here to escort you away and to say that the author can no longer trust you and you will feel the effects of it. No officer is to enter any chapter of yours again. Dancing will be absolutely prohibited unless you stand up with Jane or myself. You will, of course, be kept from the disadvantage of Lydia's society. Oh, thank God for that. And you're never even to stir from the house till you can prove that you've spent ten chapters of every volume in a rational manner. And if you observe all these strictures without complaint, the author may write in a satisfactory marriage for you to a clergyman in Matlock. And now to the instigator in all this. Lydia, how dare you go into the manuscript? I only wanted to know what happens next. What happens next is that I receive a proposal of marriage from Mr Darcy. Mr Darcy? That tall, proud man? Yes. And you two aren't anywhere near. Well, if that isn't typical, you have all the fun and we don't even make it onto the page. That is because I am the heroine. And you are a minor character and a vastly irritating one. You're not the heroine. I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. But the author says... When did you ever understand what our author says? Our author's heroines are required to possess both wit and virtue so that the emotional journey on which they must travel in her novels should be the more compelling and profound. You can't even spell profound. No, and I'm glad I can't if it means being a dried-up stick like you. Lydia! I suppose you'd rather we were all mute and modest like one of Mary Brunton's heroines. Mary Brunton? Oh, I love her books. That one where Laura gets whisked away to Canada by Hargrave, who's mad with passion for her. But she escapes, and then she's rescued by natives, and then she sails down the river on a canoe and goes over the Niagara Falls. Oh, what's it called? No, they give me the sick. I'm glad to hear it. Oh, self-control. That's it. That's so good. But you're no better, Lizzie, with your playful disposition and your fine eyes. Oh, and why, except to afford some slight amusement for an idle hour and to contrast your ignorance with my sense, would anyone wish to read about you? Because I've got tips oh, and I'm not afraid to shake them. Lydia! You've been deluding yourself to an extraordinary degree if you think that a trip to Brighton has turned you into a heroine. You're a minor character, created as an object lesson on how not to bring up a daughter. And the presumption of your raising your thoughts to Mr Darcy takes my breath away. Oh, we'll see, won't we? I deserve better, and I demand better. And I'm bloody well going to get it. Goodbye. Lydia! Lydia! Um, Look her off! She must have gone into the manuscript again. After! Quick! There is, I believe, in every disposition, a tendency to some particular evil, which... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I hate everybody. Yours is worse than me Stop coughing! I don't cough for my own amusement. You shouldn't be here. Go back. Back to Brighton. No, back home. That's your chapter over there. Kitty, I want you upstairs. Off you go. Now. Oh, it isn't fair. I never get any fun. Choose a wife. From among his daughters. Kitty! Oh, very well. Coming, Mama! But I think I'm being very ill used. Mr. Collins and Mr. Collins. Now then, which way? That way! Miss Bennett, in vain have I struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. You look surprised. I assure you, my surprise at finding myself in love with you was no less. 
I have represented to myself the degradation I must suffer in allying myself to you, a woman of such inferior birth to my own, your lack of fortune, of connections, the intolerable vulgarity of your mother, the indolence and apathy of your father, the total want of propriety shown by your younger sisters. I have dwelt on these evils with a natural and just abhorrence, but to no avail. One glance from your fine eyes undoes me quite. I am, naturally, in a fever of anxiety, lest you should refuse me. And yet I cannot believe you will. I have read encouragement in those arch smiles and playful sallies. I ask you now to put an end to my apprehension. Since the thing must be done, let it be done at once. Miss Bennet, may I hope for the honour of your hand? All right, then. Forgive me? You are rich, aren't you? Yes, very. How much have you got? Ten thousand a year. And are you a better kisser than you look? How do I look? Mostly like someone shoved a broom up you, but your face is nice. And this is all the reply which I'm to have the honour of expecting? I might perhaps wish to be informed why, with so little endeavour at civility, I am thus answered. But it is of small importance. Good, because I can't do all that flowery stuff. It's all Greek to me. If you want to marry me, I'm game. You're offering 10,000 a year. I can <laughs> offer hot sex and the best apple dumplings in Hertfordshire. Um, Come on, mister. Boil my cabbage. Well, uh, look, um, <laughs> don't think me rude or anything, but uh, this doesn't feel right. Could I ask to whom I've just proposed? Oh, Mr. Darcy. Oh, oh thank heavens. Uh, it's been a little mistake. You again? I don't believe it. Get out of my chapter. It's not your chapter. It's my chapter. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. I'm not arguing about this. Uh, uh, sorry, which one of you is Miss Elizabeth Bennet? Me, of course. Don't you know? Oh, right. I thought you'd filled out a bit. Mr. Darcy. So who's that, then? My sister Lydia. Hello. Have you been walking through this book with your eyes shut? Well, I don't get a lot to do. Just stroll about looking like someone's shoved a broom up me. To tell the truth, I've been a bit bored. Bored? Well, I'm not really a great one for romances. I prefer ghost stories. Really? Have you read The Midnight Bell? Oh, yes. Rollicking good read, I thought. And I've just been enjoying that new adventure story, The Swiss Family Robinson. Yes. Doesn't it begin with a great storm at sea? Yeah, that's the one. You Go found on. our courtship boring. I'm not surprised. There hasn't been a heaving bosom or ripped bodice in any of it. But that's about to change. Hold on to your hat, Darcy. We're whipping syllabub. <laughs> Whatever do you mean? <laughs> I mean, sister, that I've just had an offer of marriage from Mr Darcy and I've accepted. Yes. Darcy, you great blockhead. Oh, steady on. You were supposed to propose to me. Would you have said yes? No. Then where's the point? It's the plot, you ass. You propose to me and I turn you down. Why? Because I don't like you. Then you write me a long letter. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. It will be interesting. It'll be beautiful. No, sorry, not going to do it. Not going to do it? Your sister's offer sounds more fun. Ha! Huh. And I like syllabub. I knew this would happen. This is all your fault. Wherever you go, you stir up trouble. I am trouble. You don't have to be trouble. You could behave. No, I couldn't, because I'm written that way. You've read the text. I'm unguarded, uncivil, untamed, unabashed and ungovernable. And uncontrolled. And boisterous, chapter 23. And noisy and wild and fearless and self-willed, careless, violent and loud. Yes, I'm trouble. And I think the author's a stuck-up prig. You can't talk about our author like that. Why not? You've heard the way she talks about me. That's because she has suffered throughout her life from being at least 50 times cleverer than oh, anyone else around her. In a world where women are necessarily considered stupid. Well, they are, most of them. And of all the idiots with whom she's been forced to converse, leaving aside those arrogant males who are in danger of tripping up over their own cock, oh, her greatest old. resentment has been reserved for those vain, idle, coquettish imbeciles like yourself who give the rest of us a bad name and in whose company it is a punishment for any sensible woman to be. Uh, oh, you think yourself so grand, don't you? Always looking down on me and our poor mother. I don't look down on our mother. Yes, you do. I don't. I know my duty. You can't stand her. Well, she's a very stupid woman. That's right. She's stupid and I'm an imbecile. But I'm engaged to Mr Filthy Rich here and you're not, so what does that make you? <laughs> Mr Darcy... I beg you to reconsider. Marriage to my sister Lydia will be a most unequal and degrading alliance. No worse than marrying you, surely. A whole lot better, actually, because it will be huge fun. <laughs> Come on, Darcy, my fiancé. I'll show you this novel in a whole new light. The way I'd write it. A way with propriety and etiquette. There'll be high drama and villains 
and bare flesh. Oh, oh. What do you say? <laughs> he says no. All right, where do we start? At the beginning. <laughs> this way. season only, Lust and Lusciousness, or The Saviour Returns, written by and starring Miss Lydia Bennett. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a large family on the brink of financial ruin must be in want of a heroine. Oh, husband, what are we to do? Five daughters, and not one of them married. And our youngest girl, Lydia, our pride and joy, the cream of them all. She, of whom we expected such great things, forced by our poverty to London to seek her fortune at Astley's equestrian circus. Who will protect us when that wickedest of men, Mr. Collins, he who is to inherit our property in default of heirs male, turns us out of the home of our forebears. Oh, I can't say I'm sure. I'll pass the mustard. Mustard, quotha? He talks of mustard when our little kitty lies dying of consumption. <coughs> oh, I, I can't eat pork without mustard. It is an infamous fraud upon the rights of man. That isn't pork. It's squirrel. Sure. And lucky is no worse when I've had to sell the very clothes off our backs to put bread on the table. I wondered why I was so cold. Be not afraid, <coughs> dearest mother. Though we may be naked, let us pour into our wounded bosoms the balm of family love. While we have each other, what can injure us? Well, quite a lot if you don't know where you're pouring that coffee. <coughs> or is it coffee? Actually, it's horse piss. Or it would be if we could afford a horse. I'm sorry, but this is downright crude. Oh, Lord, trust you to come sticking your oar in. I've a right to comment, I suppose. No, and don't expect me to listen. Uh, sorry, I am in this, aren't I? Yes, just a minute. Carry on, please. <clears throat> oh, daughter Mary, how wisely you talk to think that a girl of your intellects should be taking in washing. The dignity of the Bennets is sunk indeed. Nay, Mama, better to take in washing than men like my poor sister Jane. Why, here she comes. Oh. Daughter oh. Jane, what news? Have you caught Mr Bingley at last? No, Ma. He declares we are to be good friends, but nothing more. Oh, 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 oh. Is it would help if I were closed. I think he suspects my motives. Oh, God. What's to be done? Our final hope rested in the possibility of Jane's marriage to a rich man. And now that hope is gone, Mr. Collins will turn us out into the streets. <gasps> Mr. Mr. Collins! Collins. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is I. Come to claim my bride, Elizabeth. You shall never have her. Why not? She's run off with Mr. Wickham of the Coldstream Guards. Oh, this is ludicrous. I don't see why. Oh, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. You show a disdain for what is natural and probable, which is typical of the worst excesses of the romantic movement. You know nothing of authorship. You're a fraud. Should we go on? Yes! Oh. Go back to the last line but one. She has run off with Mr. Sorry, when exactly do oh, I make my entrance? Oh, shut up! She has run off with Mr. Wickham of the Coldstream Guards. In that case, Mr. Bennett, sir, stand aside. But I'm sitting down. Not for much longer. I assert my claim to that sofa and to all your house and furniture. Oh. Only when I'm dead, the will is quite clear on that point. That can easily be arranged. <laughs> Daughters of the Bennett family, kiss your father goodbye. Oh. The gutter awaits you all. Oh, thou fiend. Oh, Mr. Collins, stay your oh. hell hand. Oh, help, help, help. Who shall succor us in our time of need? Did 
somebody say supper? Oh, oh, I could eat a horse. <laughs> Down, Bucephalus. Oh, Lydia, oh, daughter oh, Lydia oh, on horseback and dressed in a ripped bodice. Oh, Art thou returned from London and hast thou made thy fortune? Yes, Mama. Oh. I'm known throughout London now as Bareback Bessie. Oh, oh, oh how beautiful spirit. she is. True. What spirit she has. Yes. I must admire her <coughs> a heaving bosom. Thanks. And what splendid flag. Right, that's enough. This novel is cancelled on grounds of gross indecency, not to mention sheer implausibility and awfulness. You can't cancel my novel. I have a right to be heard. And besides, I haven't been on yet. You have no rights. You're a character in a book, a figment of our author's imagination. You're nothing more than that yourself. What gives you the right to order me about and blame me and lecture me? The unassailable right of being our author's chosen heroine. She has invested a part of herself in me. I have her brains. We think alike. We respect each other's judgment. She's given me the destiny she would have liked for herself. Well, maybe she and I aren't so unalike as you seem to think. Maybe there's a side to her which you don't see. What do you mean? I mean that she tells me things she doesn't tell you. She tells you things? Well, perhaps she doesn't tell me, but at any rate I know them. Things she'd never dream of letting you know about her hidden desires and her crazy side. She doesn't have any hidden desires. Oh, yes, she does. About being gripped by young, strong, roving hands and pushed down with sweet violence on a couch conveniently placed to break her willing fall. Oh, it's a slug. Oh, You're making this up. Possibly. And she doesn't have a crazy side. Doesn't she, then? You look in her early works. The stuff she wrote when she was little. The stuff she wrote first of all. Men dressed up as the sun and burning everyone because they've done it so well. And girls throwing themselves into streams and everyone getting drunk and running off with the butler. It's absolutely dippy and huge fun. Nonsense. <laughs> Ever nonsense as ever was talked. In fact, why am I bothering with this silly stuff? All this drawing room rubbish and girls trying to get married. I know what she really dreams about. It's what every girl dreams about in this dreary old world where the men have all the fun. Come on, Darcy, my betrothed, we're jumping novels. What? Oh, silly off. Hold on to your hats, everyone. Stop! Right where you are. Nobody gets past this door. We don't need the door. We're going through the pages. Through the pages? <laughs> Grab my hand, Darcy. I'm not good with heights. Jump! Wow! Oh, exciting! <laughs> Mr Darcy, come back! Stop at once! Come on, everyone! Next stop, the Swiss family Robinson! <laughs> Already, the tempest had continued six days. And on the seventh, its fury seems still increasing. The crew struggled to retain control of the ship. And my three daughters, Fritz, Franz and Ernst, clung to me in terror. They're not daughters, they're sons. Shh! Who's writing this book? Oh, oh Papa! What shall we do? <coughs> we, are we, are we are lost! lost. We, are we are lost! Trust in God, my girls, and we shall not perish. Luff the helm, reef down, fly the jib, pieces of eight, hard a lardboard, all hands to the mizzen, and remember you're an Englishman. Uh, they're Swiss, actually. Aye, aye, aye Papa! Papa. There are French Marines in the rigging! Shoot them down and show no mercy! I'm getting extremely wet. Uh, Captain Lydia, the first mate's had his head shot off. Well, don't just stand there. Go and look for it. Aye, aye, Captain. I'm not really dressed for this. Uh, Captain Lydia, the scurvy in the futtock shrouds. Load the guns with sauerkraut and fire at will. Aye, aye, Captain. Now, my hearts, put about. Hold your course, wear away, swing the lead, couple of shakes, reef your trunnions, there's a black spot in the binnacle, and damn Johnny Frog! Look, I don't want to be a spoil sport, but there isn't actually a naval battle in the Swiss family, Roberts. Who cares? I haven't read it anyway. And I still haven't got anything to do. Oh, Lord. All right, you can be the bosun. I don't want to be bosun, I want to be captain. Well, you can't. I'm captain. Now, let's really make things jump. Um, oh, fire in the hold! <laughs> No, that's it. Sorry, I'm not good with fire. 
I have a respiratory condition which is exacerbated by smoke. Don't you ever do anything but grumble. <laughs> yes, so do I, actually. <coughs> and anyway, I'm bored. <clears throat> Bored? Me too. Yes, Me too, actually. I and I don't want to be called Fritz. Can we do a different novel now? Yeah. What's the matter with you all? Oh. I know. How about self-control? The one where Laura gets kidnapped and taken to Canada and goes over the Niagara Falls yes. in a canoe. I told you about it. Do you remember? Oh, yes. It's the best book ever. There's Red Indians and everything. <laughs> Wait a moment. Come on, everyone. This way. <laughs> Washte chikala lachota wawaglake. Chikala lachota wawaglake. Most noble savages. <coughs> Pity a poor maiden who has been taken by force far from her native shores. Okay, this is supposed <coughs> to be my novel. Lila washte shaklela sitting bull blot and hunka. If it wasn't for me, none of you would be here. I am pursued by an atrocious villain who seeks to possess me body and soul. I have escaped from the unlawful confinement in which he placed me, but I fear his vengeance. <coughs> and I've got a shocking cough. Oh, dear. Kitty. Oh, thou kind and wise old warrior. And you, his squaws, will you not help me, a defenceless virgin? I throw myself on your mercy. This is complete garbage. No, it isn't. Yeah, but the still is the part for me. It's dreadful. The heroine makes me want to puke, and I'm sure natives don't talk like that. We're well, doing our best. Oh, so you want realism now, do you? Well, that is a turn up for the book, Miss Lydia. I'm going to flirt with six officers at once. Bennett wants everything to be natural. Lydia, I've got tits and I want the whole room to see them. Doesn't approve of excess all of a sudden. Kitty! Well, I'm sorry, but as far as I'm concerned, all that probable and everyday stuff is finished. I'm going off in my canoe and sucks to anyone who says I'm not. Come on, cast. Let's shoot Niagara. Niagara, Lila, who's me? Niagara, Lila, who's me? And afterwards, we'll get a native poultice on that chest of yours. To the herbs myself, I did. Thanks, Daddy. But you can't go sailing over the Niagara Falls. The idea's just silly. <laughs> Impudence and ingratitude of some people. I'd like to do a ghost story now. A ghost story? Yes. Oh, how about the midnight bell? Oh, Lord. You're such an idiot, Darcy. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You're insufferably dull, intolerably stupid and an ass. I'm clever. It says so in Chapter 4. You haven't said or done a single clever thing since you proposed to me. It's as if you turned into a different person the moment I said yes. Well, if it comes to that, you talked about sex and dumplings and that and then nothing happened. I don't think you'd really done any, had you? Of course not. I'm 15. And the author never writes about that sort of thing. But we think about it. We think about it again and again. Oh, Lydia. Mm. Mr <sighs> Darcy. There you are. Oh, I prefer the English countryside, I think. <laughs> How's the happy couple? I couldn't say. <clears throat> I don't think we're very well suited. I never thought you were. You would say that. You wanted to marry him yourself. Yes. But I don't think that prejudiced me. Your disposition and talents are so different that anyone must have thought the same. Yeah. Is that what you thought, Darcy? Well, I didn't have much to do in your stories. Even less than you had to do in the author's. Oh, speaking of the author, I have a letter here from her to you. A letter to me? Well, from the author? Yes, here it is. Yeah, that's very singular. Quite an honour, I should think. Oh, Lord. Whatever is it? I'm going to be written out, aren't I? Oh, I don't know. I'm just the messenger. I don't think I can open this. While you're thinking about it, Mr Darcy, hmm? could we rehearse our proposal scene? Oh, this disruption has made me a little shy of it. 
Our proposal scene? Yes. I'd like to go through it before we perform it in its right chapter. The first one, that is. The one where I turn you down. Do you accept me later on, then? Of course I do. You great tall fellow. Oh. Well, I didn't know that. Had I known it, I think... Uh... I see. <clears throat> well, uh, where shall we go from? Oh, well, let's see. Um, you've asked me to marry you, but in a very arrogant manner, and I've declined angrily, and you say something like, and this is all the reply I am to expect. Oh, uh, all the reply which I am to have the honour of expecting. Yes. yes. Uh, I might perhaps wish to be informed why, with so little endeavour at civility, mm. I am thus rejected. Uh, but it is of small importance. I might as well inquire why, with so evident a design of offending and insulting me, you chose to tell me that you liked me against your will, against your reason, and even against your character. Was not this some excuse for incivility, if I was uncivil? Flowery stuff. You see, I can't do it. But I have other provocations. You know I have. Your character was unfolded to me in the recital I received many months ago from Mr Wickham. <laughs> Who? Or Chislam. You take an eager interest in that gentleman's concerns? Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feeling an interest in him. His misfortunes? <laughs> yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. And of your infliction. You have deprived the best years of his life of that independence which was no less his due than his desert. And this is the estimation in which you hold me. I thank you for explaining it so fully. But perhaps these offences might have been overlooked had not your pride been hurt by my honest confession of the scruples that had long prevented my forming any serious design. You are mistaken, Mr Darcy. If you suppose that the mode of your declaration affected me in any other way than as it spared me the concern which I might have felt in refusing you, had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. Gosh. From the very beginning of my acquaintance with you, your arrogance... Your conceit and your selfish disdain of the feelings of others were such as to form that groundwork of disapprobation on which succeeding events have built so immovable a dislike. And I had not known you a month before I felt that you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed on to marry. You have said quite enough, madam. I perfectly comprehend your feelings. <laughs> And have now only to be ashamed of what my own have been. Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time. <laughs> and uh, accept my best wishes for your health and happiness. <laughs> I suppose it is better than mine. <laughs> mm. What was it you did to Wickham? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Wickham? She says you ill-treated Wickham. What did you do? Oh, why don't you ask him? Mm. You're due to elope with him soon. Oh. Mm. Mm. I think I'll open my letter. <clears throat> to Miss Lydia Bennet. I have had great amusement from your adventures. What a creature you are. Perfectly without nerves. Quite unrepulsable, hardened and impudent. And yet... What a deal of imagination you have. So much flight of mind and such an utter want of principle. Oh, you are the paragon of all that is wrong-headed and silly and eccentric and provoking. You are quite right. I wrote a lot of nonsense when I was younger, but I have grown up now. And yet, there has been a kind of pleasure in glimpsing again those absurdities and follies and high spirits which were once my portion. Thank you, my dear Lydia. I had quite forgotten that I used to gargle, or that, in an effort to make me stop, my sister Cassandra threw a chamber pot at me. <laughs> in gratitude, therefore, I have decided to send you and Wickham not up to Gretna Green, but to London instead where you can be as unprincipled and wild as you please. And to that end, I enclose a little book, oh, which I think will supply your fancy most amusingly. It is from my Uncle E. Parrott's library. I found it there years ago when I was quite a child and not knowing what it was, took it down because I liked the title and smuggled it out under my dress. But if you model yourself on this heroine, you need employ no such stratagem. Nobody shall see you. It will all happen off the page. And what a time you will have. And do not fret. 
I will marry you off at last in a nice white dress with lots of lace. Please to return to the manuscript on receipt of this, Lydia, as it is really time to continue with my narrative. If I allow my fancy any further liberties, I shall never get on. I remain yours affectionately, Jane Austen. Well, shall we go? Kitty and the others should be back by now. I think we should. <laughs> hey, day, Miss Lydia, <laughs> Miss Elizabeth, Mr. Darcy, Mr. Mr. Wickham. Good heavens, it's old cheese slab. <sighs> Miss Lydia, all raillery on the subject of my chin will be unnecessary. There are a lot of names I could call you, but it would be injudicious. We are to run off together, so we may as well make the best of it. Eh? After all, you are, as you say, a very well-grown girl with high animal spirits. <laughs> And I am a man of the world. Wickham, hmm? have you read this book? Oh, read it? I've practically lived it. Really? I can recite it word for word. Darcy, we mm. must go. Goodbye, Lydia. Goodbye, Wickham. Uh, yes, goodbye. I shall see you back in Chapter 39, Lydia, won't mm. I? You might do. Probably. Mm -hmm. Yes. <sighs> so then. Hmm. Fanny Hill. Or the memoirs of a woman of pleasure. Ooh, recite me a little. Are you sure, Miss Bennet? It is generally considered to be unsuitable for ladies. Oh, it won't worry me then, will it? So get on with it. Yeah. Uh, well, now. Yes. Uh, well, this is one of my favourite passages. Uh, it concerns Polly, a girl of 17 and a young Genoese merchant. Fanny Hill is spying on them through a crack in a partition wall. Her face, uh, Polly's face, that is, was regular and sweet, her shape exquisite, uh, nor could I help envying her two ripe, enchanting breasts, <gasps> finely plumped out. Beneath them lay the delicious tract of the belly, two fleshy thighs, <gasps> and the richest sable fur in the universe. And what's the Genoese merchant doing all this while? Well, Fanny says that the young Italian, uh -huh. still in his shirt, stood gazing and transported at the sight of beauties that might have fired a dying hermit. <laughs> his eager eyes devoured her, and neither were his hands excluded their share of the feast, but wandered on the hunt of pleasure over every part and inch of her body. Shall I go on? It's... Yes! <laughs> yeah. Oh, you don't know any more, do you? I'm afraid not. I, I imagine that is all the author read herself. I certainly hope so. You said you'd practically lived it. What a braggart you are! Well, my character is that of a braggart. And in my defence, the author does mention my intrigues and seductions in chapter 48. But I'm unsure what exactly was in her, her thoughts. Well, if you're too green, I shall have to read it for myself. Because she did read the rest. I know she did. Look, here it is. Guess my surprise when I saw the lazy young rogue lie down on his back and gently pull his mistress down upon him, who, giving way to his humour, ran directly upon the flaming point of his weapon of pleasure. Lydia. Do you know, I've always wondered where I got that from. I thought I made it up myself. Made it up yourself? Well, I do have a very lively imagination. Yes. Come on, Wickham. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Brighton. Mm. <laughs> Come on. Come on. In Unseen Austin by Judith French, Lydia Bennett was played by Jodie Whittaker, Elizabeth Bennett by Claire Corbett, Mr Darcy by Gunnar Cawthray, and Kitty Bennett by Jill Cardo. George Wickham was Chris Pavlo, Mr Bennett Stephen Critchlow, and Mrs Bennett Janice Aqua. The director was John Culpanti. After the news, Stuart Henderson visits a Northamptonshire building with more hidden secrets than Da Vinci. Questions, Questions is in a couple of minutes' time.
BBC News at three o'clock. The presidential candidates John McCain and Barack Obama have been invited to the White House to join the negotiations on the $700 billion rescue package for the US. The two candidates have described the plan as flawed, but said efforts to protect the economy must not fail. The NATO-led force in Afghanistan has said its helicopters have been fired on from a Pakistani military checkpoint on the border. There were no reports of casualties. NATO says its helicopters had not crossed into Pakistan's airspace. The Home Secretary Jackie Smith has revealed the design for the identity card. Each one will carry the bearer's photo, name and biometric data. Here's Rory McLean. The ID cards containing a picture and fingerprint stored on a computer chip will start to be issued in November to foreign students and people renewing visas obtained by marriage, although it will take five years to provide cards for 90% of foreign nationals. Next year, workers in locations like airports will have to have them, although there is resistance from the TUC to this and the scheme in general. By 2010, young people will be offered cards on a voluntary basis, and a year or so later, everyone else will be offered a card. Opponents say the idea is a waste of money and unlikely to be secure. The Liberal Democrats say they won't appeal against the Information Commissioner's order to stop making automated phone calls to potential voters. The party made 250,000 calls featuring a recorded message from their leader, Nick Clegg. South African MPs have elected the deputy leader of the African National...